All right, I am going to be reading today from Who Was George Bonga, and I am going to not be reading this yellow part. If you see my, my mouse there, I'm gonna be reading the purple part. This is a story by William Durbin. He's also the same author who wrote our book about Pierre that we have here in the classroom. And he lives up in Northern Minnesota. He writes about things from Minnesota. Right. Meet the guide. I'm starting on the second page. The wood floor cracked as Louis stepped into the log storehouse. The dim light made it difficult to see. Hello, Louis called. Is anybody? Before he could finish his question, a huge voice boomed. Hello, yourself. A man stood on the other end of the room. He held a pile of wool trading blankets in his arms. Louis jumped, startled by the loud voice. The man dropped his blankets and walked towards him. He was the biggest and blackest man that Louis had ever seen. He had nearly touched the log beam that ran down the middle of the cabin. He was wearing a broadcloth shirt, pants, and leather boots. I'm George Bonga, he grinned. By the look on your face, I can tell you've never seen a white man. A white man? Louis looked to see if there was anyone else in the room. But you're so black? Bunga laughed with a huge laugh. Louis didn't know what to say. He was only 14 years old, and this was his first summer as a voyager. Welcome to Fond du Lac. Bunga reached out and shook Louis's hand, lifting him onto his tiptoes. Nice to meet you, Louis said, feeling like his teeth were rattling. I'm Louis Pomeroy. Bonga suddenly frowned. Where are the others? They had trouble getting a crew together at Fort Misery. How many fellows came with you? Just me. We asked for three men, Bonga said. The fellows at the fort are tired of hauling barrels of fish. Half of them have deserted. They said they signed on as fur traders, not fishmongers. Bonga laughed again. Can't say I blame them. We're packing our share of fish here these days. Are you a good paddler? Made it all the way from Montreal. Bonga looked Louis up and down. I'm short, but I'm strong, Louis said. At five feet, four inches, Louis was an average height for a voyager, but he felt more like a child next to Bonga, who was more than a foot taller. You'd better be strong. I promised to deliver four canoes of trade goods to Leech Lake before freeze up, and we've only got 14 men, which leaves you two men short, Louis said. I can see you know your math, Professor, Bunga laughed. The only other fellow I have handy is my assistant, Kado, and he's got a wooden leg. Both yours are real, aren't they? Bunga grabbed a long canoe paddle that was leaning against the wall and tapped Louis's shins. Ow, Louis said as Bunga grinned. The two of us will handle one north canoe ourselves. Louis's eyes widened. Don't they hold 3,000 pounds? I hope you can paddle as well as you can count, Professor. Day two. Time to voyage. Bunga poked Louis's ribs with his paddle. What's that? Louis sat up with a start. The sky was still half dark, but the other voyagers had already broken camp. Roll up your blanket, Professor, Bunga said, wearing a deerskin shirt and moccasins this morning. Bunga looked more like an Ojibwe trapper than a fur trader. Louis followed Bunga down to the bank of the St. Louis River. Three canoes were already loaded, and the dock was piled with a ton and a half of freight that would fill Bunga's canoe. Five 90-pound bales of trade goods, plus a case of Northwest guns, bags of lead, balls and bird shot for the guns, kegs of gunpowder, sacks of flour, kegs of wine and side pork, iron works for the Ojibwe trappers, sacks of tobacco, and kettles. They would need to deliver the trade goods to trade posts where the traders would give them to Ojibwe families in return for beaver furs to be trapped and delivered throughout the winter. Ten minutes later, Louis was seated in the bow of the loaded canoe with Bunga in the stern. Which side should I paddle on? Louis's head was spinning. Take your pick, Bunga said. Louis reached out to paddle, but Bunga's first stroke shot the canoe forward so fast that Louis tipped all backwards. The voyagers in the other canoe all laughed. Don't be lying down on the job, Professor, Bunga chuckled. 
taking another powerful stroke. You keep a steady pace and I'll handle the steering. Okay, Louis nodded, trying to relax. He began pulling at a normal pace. Louis was amazed as they skimmed up river like a ship under sail. He had never traveled so fast in a canoe. Bunga struck up a familiar song, A la Claire Fontaine, at the clear running fountain, sauntering by one day. The men in the trailing canoes joined in at the chorus. Your love long since overcame me, ever in my heart you'll stay. When the current began to speed up, Bunga said, Hear that, Professor? Louis stopped paddling and heard the roar of rapids. That's the Dalé, Bunga said. We'll land below them, that bald rock. Portage test. When they neared the shore, Louis stepped into the shallows and turned his canoe sideways to unload. Bunga grabbed a parcel of trade goods in each hand and carried them up the bank. As soon as the canoe was empty, Bunga picked it up by this center thwart. Let me help, Louis said, knowing that two men always portage a north canoe. Birch bark is light. Bunga chuckled as he walked up the bank, holding the canoe against his hip. After all four canoes were unloaded, Bunga said, time for a little stroll. He swung a parcel of trade goods onto his back, slipped a trump line around his forehead. Then he told Louis, help me boost the next bundle up. Louis stacked on another parcel. Bunga said, I'll take one more. Louis had seen men carry three packs, but never on a portage this steep or rocky. Bunga was so tall that Louis had to stand on a rock to hoist the third parcel high enough to settle between Bunga's shoulders. Now two parcels up front, Louis stammered, but, but that would be 450 pounds. Fine multiplying, Professor, Bunga laughed. I know the routine. A bowman named Jacques stepped up and helped strap two parcels on Bunga's chest. Louis stared in disbelief. As Bunga leaned forward and started up the trail, his crewmen champ chanted, Bunga, Bunga, Bunga. He'll never make it, a short man said to Jacques. We'll see, Jacques replied. Then turning to Louis, he said, Bunga likes to start his trips with a little test. You'd better hurry if you want to see the finish. Shouldering a single parcel, Louis ran after Bunga. The rest of the crowd followed. At first, Louis trotted up and Bunga hummed a tune. When the trail steepened, Bunga stopped humming and took deep breaths. His calf muscles bulged and his moccasins slipped on loose rocks. You can make it, Louis said. Thanks, Professor. Bunga spoke through gritted teeth. Once Bunga crested the ridge, his stride lengthened again. From there, it was just a short march to the river's edge. The men all cheered when he reached the calm pool above the rapids. Jock pulled out a coin purse and said, the time of reckoning has come. The handful of men who wagered against Bunga dropped a coin into Jock's palm. Then Jock jingled his purse and asked Bunga, you want your share now or later? Hold it for me, he said. We've got canoes to carry. The Swampy Portage. The lower St. Louis River was a mix of rapids, black shoots of rock and waterfall. Hundred foot tall white pines grew along the rugged, rocky shoreline. But other than a few short pipe breaks that day, Bunga gave the crew no time to admire the scenery. Four days later, they turned up the East Savannah River. The farther they paddled west, the more the channel meandered and narrowed. Thick reed beds slowed down their canoes. Trees formed a tangled green canopy that blocked the sun. Louis slapped at clouds of mosquitoes, but Bunga only said, those little creatures don't eat much. By the second day, swamp grass had closed in so tightly that Louis couldn't get his paddle into the water. Portage time, Bunga called. Louis stepped out of the canoe and sank to his ankles in smelly black muck. Be careful you don't lose your professors, your moccasins, professor. Bunga laughed. For four more grueling days, Bunga led the way across the Savannah Portage. The voyagers cursed the knee-deep mud, the alder brush, and the thorns that cut their faces, and the swamp grass grew taller over their heads. But Bunga sang silly folk songs to keep the spirits of men up. The ground gradually got higher as they crossed the continental divide. 
By the end of the portage, half the men were limping and all had bloody cuts and torn shirts and sashes. Declaring the stream wide enough to float a canoe, Bunga called, Leech Lake, here we come. Heroes welcome. That afternoon, the crew arrived at Leech Lake Trading Post. 20 or 30 men and women, Voyagers and Ojibwe, greeted Bunga with a hero's welcome. When Bunga raised his paddle and waved, two men fired guns into the air, raining birdshot down on all four canoes. Now that's what I call a fine reception, Professor, Bunga smiled. The Indians in these parts are partial to me. My mother was one of them, and folks think it's real special that I was the first black man born in this part of the country. Louis shook his head and grinned. Whether Bunga came, claimed to be black, white, Ojibwe, or something else, there's no doubt that he was 100% original. And there's George Bunga. Well, that was a good story. <laughs>